Friends, what if there were, what if there were a window that you could look through and see God? What if there were a window that you could look through and see heaven? How much could we charge if we had that window here hmm? in our building, right? Oh, I don't see anything. Oh, you have to, you have to look with the eyes of the Spirit, right? My, my claim today, what I want to talk about today is my belief that that window exists, okay? That window exists. We're going to talk about that. We are starting a new sermon series today. We're going to spend six weeks talking about Jesus. I know that's a real novel concept, right, here in a, in a Christian church. We're going to talk about Jesus, the, the many aspects and, and roles of Jesus Christ. And, and we're sort of framing this around the question that we raise really every week, the question that, that Jesus asked Peter, who do you say that I am? And my prayer for you, okay, is that, is that as we move through this time, that as we emerge from this study, that, that you will have your own answer uh, to that question uh, grounded in your faith and your unique relationship with God as you, as you perceive God moving through Christ in the pages of, of this book and through your prayer life. Uh, we, we all want to explore that together. As a matter of fact, I'm also going to offer uh, a Bible study in parallel with this, okay? You'll have the chance, if you want to, to come and sit with me, kind of unpack some of this together, talk about it, uh, wrestle with, with hard questions about uh, who Jesus was, who Jesus is for us today, and shape those answers together. All right, today we're going to start with talking about Jesus as Word of God. And this is deep stuff, y'all. You, you got a cheesy eight-minute sermon last week. Not today. Not today, okay? We're going, we're going deep. You missed your chance last week if that's what you were looking for. All right, we're going, we're going deep together today. Jesus as Word of God. To talk about that, we have to go all the way back to the beginning. Really, before the beginning. Okay? 1 John 4 says, God is love. And before there was anything, before there was creation, before there was time and space, there was God. There was pure love. Right? Pure love. You can try to picture it. Uh, good luck. Right, because a, a picture, an image is itself part of creation, right? Something that we see. We're talking about what existed outside of and before there was creation. Just pure love. No, no time, no space, no dimension, no proportion, no color. Just love. Just the heart of God. And then from there, from there, God decided to create. Okay, this pure love decided to create. Why? Why? Well, first of all, Doc Coleman said last week something I think pretty wise. He said, you know, one of the best things that we human beings can learn to say is, I don't know, <laughs> right? That's a hard thing to say. It's a really good thing to be able to say. It's important to be able to say that. And the last thing that I would claim today is that, that I or any of us have God and God's purposes all figured out and buttoned down and boxed up, okay? That is, that's not our task here today. However, to that question, why? Why did God create? The best answer I've ever heard is still the 900-year-old answer of the Christian theologian and scholar Thomas Aquinas, okay? He said this. He said, God is love. And what does love always seek to do? It always seeks to spread itself. If you have loved, everybody in this room has loved, okay? If you have loved, you know that you can't keep it to yourself, okay? So God set out to create, not because God lacked anything, not because God needed anything, not because God was lonely, but because God was love, and because God's nature as love was and is to spread God's self, to make God's self, to make that love known, okay, to make it 
manifest. So, so to do this, to create, God had something like, and we're always sort of talking in metaphors here because our language always falls short of the fullness of God, okay? But God had something like a voice, okay? God spoke, and this voice went forth from the, the heart of God and created everything, created the universe, created time and space and everything in it, right? From, from atoms to Adam, God created people in God's own divine love image. And here's what I love about this, and this is hard to wrap our heads around, but if you can't get your head around it, get your heart around it, okay? Every time, every time a person is created and comes to, to know that, that love that is God, God has succeeded in spreading God's self, okay? God has spread God's love. God has spread God's self. Josh, that, that song that you just sang up there is one of my favorites. Uh, I, want, I want to read again just a few of the words uh, of, that, of that song that, that you just sang up there. God of creation, there at the start, before the beginning of time, with no point of reference, you spoke to the dark and fleshed out the wonder of light. And as you speak, a hundred billion galaxies are born. In the vapor of your breath, the voice that we're talking about, right? In the vapor of your breath, the planets form. If the stars were made to worship, so will I. I can see your heart. And this is, this is the theme here, okay? I can see your heart in everything you've made. Every burning star, a signal fire of grace. If creation sings your praises, so will I. You did something up there singing that song today, and, and I still remember the first time you sang that song. You did it then, too. You did it again today. You got choked up, didn't you? you got ch I remember the first time Josh sang that song up here, he got choked up. Now, I didn't mean to put you on the spot here, but I, I, I kind of did. Sorry, not sorry. <laughs> Why? Why'd you get choked up? <laughs> he said, why do you got to ask me that question? Well, it's really that one line, mm. which is, uh, everyone a child you died to save. Mm. You got choked up again right now, just saying it again. Th this, this God, this pure love that, that was before anything was, actually chooses each of us, uh, knows us, loves us, much, loves us enough to, to come and be with us and, and journey with us and struggle with and for us and die for us. Actually, this, this, this pure love that was before the beginning of time chooses you, chooses to, to die for you. That's crazy. It's crazy. It's a miracle. All right, now this, this creative voice we're talking about here has been called by many names over the ages, right? It's been called the second person of the Trinity. The Greeks of the first century called it logos, and you know what that means because you know what a logo is, right? Uh, a logo, what is a logo? It's something that represents something else, right? Um, we, we can take our First Christian Church logo and put it out there in the community, and it sort of represents us to the people of this community. The logos, the logos of God, represents an unknowable, uncontainable, indescribable God in creation. Okay, manifests that God, makes God knowable within creation. All right, now when the translators of the New Testament, people translating from the Greek into the English, they, they looked at that word logos, and what word did they use to translate logos into English? Word. 
They use the word word because a word is kind of like a logo, right? It's something that represents something else. It's something that represents a concept to make it understandable, tangible, knowable, right? The word of God, that aspect of God that makes it possible to know something about a God who exists beyond what's knowable, right? Uh, A God that exists, that pure love that exists beyond touching and knowing. The word of God, the logos of God, that voice of God makes God knowable. And with all that in mind now, I want us to look together and explore a passage that you have probably read a hundred times. Maybe you, maybe you kind of got it. Maybe it sort of went right over your head. It's one of those deeply theological passages. It sounds like something you'd read in the Tao Te Ching or something like that, okay? But I want us, with all of that in mind, to look anew at this beautiful, amazing passage of Scripture that comes from the Gospel according to John. First chapter of John. Let's look at this together. In the beginning was the Word, right? That voice of God that represented God in creation. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through Him. And without Him, not one thing came into being. What has come into being in him was life, and the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it or overtake it. Verse 6 introduces John the Baptist. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify to the light so that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light, but he came to testify to the light. The true light, which enlightens everyone, was coming into the world. All right, verse 10. He was in the world. Okay, this this word, this voice, this aspect of God that makes God knowable. He was in the world, and the world came into being through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to what was his own, and his own people did not accept him. Okay, so the, the, the word went out, right? And all things came into being with the express purpose of manifesting God's love, making God's love known, making it exist in a tangible way. And then what happened? Creation lost sight of Creator. We lost sight of this amazing love. We chose ourselves and our own way over God and God's way and God's character, right? But instead of giving up on us, God chose to take it to the next level to help us remember God's love. To all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God who were born not of blood or of the will of the flesh or of the will of man, but of God. And how, how did God, how did this voice of God take it to the next level that we might remember be restored to God's love? Here's the most miraculous verse in the New Testament, in my opinion. Verse 14, and the Word became flesh. The Word became flesh and lived among us, and we have seen His glory, the glory as of a Father's only Son, full of grace and truth. John testified to him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks ahead of me because he was before me. That's confusing, but now you understand why, right? This is the same word of God that has always been, that, that, uh, that was the beginning, that gave rise to all things. From his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. The law indeed was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God. It is God the only Son who is close to the Father's heart who has made Him known. This is, literally now, this is the Word of God for the people of God. And together we say, 
Thanks be to God. Okay, so you see, there's, there's one more name. We've been talking about names for this voice of God. Second person of the Trinity, uh, Logos, Word of God. There's, there's one more name for this voice, this Word, this Logos of God. Christ. Christ. The ultimate embodiment of God's voice. Jesus was a man. Okay, born of a woman, uh, born presumably in year one, probably 4 B.C. or so. Scholars think we might have counted a little bit wrong, lived till about 30 A.D. He was a man, and in some way that's really difficult for us to understand, he was also more than that. He was divine. He was the one who is past, present, and future, right? The Word of God made flesh. That Word, that voice of God that had been around since the beginning, uh, that, that was the beginning, but now in human form, in human form, so that we can really see Him and touch Him and relate to Him and relate through Him to God. Wow. Wow. We're gonna talk over the next several weeks about Again, the, these many things that Jesus was and is. Uh, teacher, healer, savior. But I wanted to start here because I want us to recognize from the beginning of this study that Jesus Christ is, is while well, yes, a man, in some way also more than that. A representative of God that has been around since the beginning. The one who is past, present, and future. We had a, a wonderful man here who was a retired minister. He taught the disciples class for many years. His name was Jim Oglesby. Many of you know Jim still. And Jim told me a really funny story years ago. He said uh, that he went to see his mom at the retirement home, okay, and, and went to sit down and have dinner with her. And she sits down. She was up there in years, and and the food came out, and she looked down at it, and she said, oh, Hebrews 13, 8. And Jim said, what, Hebrews 13, 8, what, what's that, Mama? And she said, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. <laughs> and I love that story, because I think it's funny. But also, I, I love that Jim told me that story, because it seared into my mind and I think Hebrews 13.8 represents something really important, right? The same yesterday, today, and forever. This is the one who is past, present, and future. And we have to recognize if we, if we desire to transcend the, the challenges, the messiness, the blah of this life, we have to recognize that we are held by a Christ who is past, present, and future. One who is a bridge from, from creation to creator precisely because he is God's voice speaking forth from that hot core of love that, that was and is and is to be. Thank you, Jesus. See, we do, we do have a window on God. We do have a window on God. You can, you can prayerfully open this book, this collection of, of books, and you can read inspired testimonies of people that, that walked around Galilee with Jesus. You can, you can watch with the eyes of your heart, okay, as he heals and as he teaches. You can, you can hear his words, perhaps with the eyes of your heart. You can even see the love in his eyes, you can go on this journey with Jesus. And that's, that's, that's amazing. You are, you are not just, understand, you are not just learning from a great teacher about how to stop breaking rules, okay? You are witnessing. You are witnessing the Word of God made flesh, that original core of pure love that we call God that has existed before, since before there was beginning right, actually speaks to you. That's why you got choked up. Actually cares about you, right? It's a miracle. God calls you 
through Christ to be in relationship with him. God, through Jesus Christ, reveals God's character, God's love, and invites you to take on that character, right? To put away sin, which is that selfish action that distracts us from this amazing divine dance with with the love that is God, to put that away and become united to the love that is above all and through all and in all. Amen? Amen. Amen. I was at church camp years ago out at Disciples Crossing, Crossing in Athens, Texas. Wonderful place out there. And, uh, and we had this particularly meaningful, powerful worship service one night. And at the end of the service, there was a boy. I looked over and I saw this boy. We all got up, you know, to leave and go back to our dorms. And there was a boy, probably 16, 17 years old, sitting still where he, where he had sat through the worship service by himself, crying. And so I went over and I just sat down next to him and I said, hey buddy, what's, what's going on? And he looked up and he said, with tears in his eyes, I see. <laughs> and I said, what do you see? And I could tell he was struggling for the right words. And he said, I, I see everything. And I had to resist the temptation to say, let me borrow your glasses. <laughs> that greater part of me wanted to weep with him. Because on some level, I knew what he was talking about right? That this, that this child of God in this moment had been given the gift of seeing beyond all the lines and the boundaries of space and time. That he had seen into the heart of God and that the heart of God had come home in him. Thanks be to God. Amen.